Hey guys, here's your next set of rocks notes. So our next type of rocks are sedimentary rocks and they actually are going to make up the majority of our crust. Um, so we're going to see those most often. And they're especially helpful because they give us clues about our past. So before humans were here, we can look at uh, the fossils, we can look at the uh, different layers and or what we call the beds um, of the rock and we can look at how those layers are different. We can look at, um, again, the fossils that are in different layers and we can kind of reconstruct what was going on even before we were around. So those layers, um, we also call those strata and um, there are areas where we see these bedding planes. So like, for example, we see like these lines are really um, striking, I guess, like we can notice those, they're no, more noticeable. Um, and so that kind of gives you an idea of like, okay, something, some sort of major change occurred during those, uh, during that time. So we call those bedding planes. So our sedimentary rocks, as we know from talking about our rock cycle, includes um, a, a couple of steps. So first of all, we need some sort of weathering and erosion to occur. So the weathering and from wind, water, and glaciers is going to break down some other kind of rock, maybe like an igneous rock that crystallized from magma. And now if that gets weathered, we are going to create some sediment. That sediment then gets transported or eroded away, and that could be uh, because of gravity pulling it down, running water, carrying it somewhere else, a glacier carrying it somewhere else, wind carrying it somewhere else. So our sediment is going to do a little traveling, and then it's going to get deposited somewhere. So basically it stops traveling, and then it's going to go through lithification. So we've got two parts of lithification. So it's going to, that sediment's going to get compacted together and it's going to get cemented together or glued together. So um, once it has been compacted and cemented together, that's what's going to form our sedimentary rock. So um, as more layers of our sediment are deposited, then we're going to get even more compaction or compression because it's heavier. So there will be less space between our pieces of sediment. And then um, our, um, so water also is going to carry that mineral matter or those sediments um, into the spaces between those particles, depending on how much space is available. So our sedimentary rocks um, are in two major categories. The first major category are called detrital sedimentary rocks. These are classified based on the size of the particles or the size of the sediment that makes up that sedimentary rock. So these happen to be in order from largest sediment size to uh, smallest. So first up we have a conglomerate so and a breccia. So they both have large particles. The difference between them is that conglomerates have rounded um, particles or sediments and the reason that they are rounded is because they have been they have gone through some weathering on their own um, so it means that they probably have done some traveling they've probably got knocked around a little bit and so their edges are rounded where with the breccia at the bottom um, those pieces are more angular they're not as rounded because it probably formed more recently or has not been exposed to as much weathering or as much travel, so its edges are not rounded like the conglomerate. So I will show you um, our example of a conglomerate. So here's our conglomerate. Let me see if I can get. So we can hopefully see that there are some of these little rounded particles and they're all kind of glued together. It kind of looks like a bunch of like sand pieces were glued together with some little minerals 
and that's our conglomerate. Then we're going to get some smaller particle sizes. So next we have sandstone. So in a sandstone, the particles are the size of sand and they are again glued together to make that sandstone. Siltstone is even um, smaller particles and then shale is going to have the most fine grained pieces or the smallest pieces and shale also happens to be our most abundant um, detrital sedimentary rock. I will show you those. So first we've got a sandstone. This is a red sandstone. Again, small particles. And then even smaller particles with, um, this is a shale. So shale is what like you see like in a riverbed, like if you're walking in the river and then you've got all of those like layers of rock on the side and if you try to walk up them, they break, that's shale. Okay, so those are my detrital ones. Again, largest to smallest. Um, in terms of their particle size. So you have a few pictures of them to help you remember as well. So like we said before, the size of the particles tells you um, about how the rock was formed and kind of what its life is like, has been like since it was formed, like the conglomerates and the breccias with their rounded or angular uh, pieces. So, um, your fast paced rivers um, are going to have more energy so they can carry larger sediments. Um, same thing with wind. The more windier it is, the stronger the wind, the bigger the particles are that can be carried. Where if you have um, um, quieter environments, so not as much energy, so example like a lake or a pond where there's not a lot of movement or a lot of energy. Um, that's where we're going to find our siltstones and shales because they're not energetic enough to carry the bigger sediments around. So those were the detrital chemical or detrital sedimentary rocks. These are the chemical sedimentary rocks. So this is a different category. Um, and these ones aren't really in any sort of order. So we just kind of have like a list of these are all of the types. So these are going to be um, formed because they were in solution. So they were dissolved like in the water, for example, right? the river water, et cetera. And then they end up precipitating out. So instead of being dissolved, now they're no longer dissolved, they kind of fall to the bottom, for example, and um, that forms our chemical sedimentary rocks. Um, so chemical sedimentary rocks are also going to be related or have a biochemical origin, so bio meaning life. So we're talking about water dwelling organisms and how they um, are going to basically let go of things like their shells and other hard parts when they die. And then those shells, for example, can be kind of, again, cemented or glued together to form um, a specific type of chemical sedimentary rock, which we will see. Um, these ones are classified by what minerals are in the chemical sedimentary rock instead of looking at like the particle size. Okay, so limestone in the middle, this is our most abundant chemical sedimentary rock. It's predominantly made of calcite. Uh, we learned a little bit about calcite when we were talking about our minerals. Coquina is the one where these shell fragments are glued together. And then chalk is also considered a chemical sedimentary rock because again, it's made of those hard parts of microorganisms. 
more chemical sedimentary rocks. So we have travertine, which has um, calcium carbonate in it, which is calcite. Um, but it forms because the carbon dioxide that was once dissolved in the water has been able to escape or uh, leave the water, and it leaves the calcium carbonate behind in the form of travertine. And then we have another category of chemical sedimentary rocks called evaporites. These are deposits left behind um, when water evaporates, and then these minerals are left behind. So these are going to be consist of things like halite and gypsum. Another type of chemical sedimentary rock is coal. Um, and there are lots of different types of coal. And so you can see as we go from left to right that we're increasing how much carbon is in each of those types of coal. So the more uh, carbon we have in the coal, uh, the better our electrical output if we're using coal for energy, for example. Um, but you can see that it gets these higher levels of coal and gets higher and higher ranking as it goes under more heat and pressure and then also more time. Another chemical sedimentary rock, these are called silicon dioxide rocks. So all of these that are listed here at the bottom are your silicon dioxide rocks. Uh, the agate you might see as like you might recognize if you've been to like a souvenir shop and they have like a big like container of rocks or they might call them gems and then you get like a little bag and you fill it up with whichever ones you want so that's agate okay our metamorphic rocks are our last category so metamorphic truly means to change form so for us to have a metamorphic rock it means we had to have had another type of rock first. So igneous, sedimentary, or maybe another type of metamorphic rock, because a metamorphic rock can actually become another type of metamorphic rock if it goes under that high heat and high pressure. Um, another um, agent of metamorphism is also uh, what we consider chemically active fluids, which also help to make that change. So like I said, we're going to have some metamorphic rocks that turn into other metamorphic rocks. So we see here that as if we start as a slate and it goes through more metamorphism, so more heat pressure and chemically active fluids, it becomes a phyllite and then a schist and then a gneiss. So um, again, low grade to high grade metamorphism, more heat, more pressure. Um, if there's too much metamorphism, so too much heat and pressure, then that could potentially destroy fossils and bedding planes. And we said that that's really important to figuring out our uh, geologic history. So um, that can sometimes cause like pieces of our puzzle to be missing. Two types of metamorphism. So we've got contact and thermal contact slash thermal metamorphism, and then the other is called regional metamorphism. So your contact or thermal metamorphism um, is purely just that the parent rock, the original rock, um, heats up. Regional metamorphism is like a huge area of rock that is being subjected to pressure and also high temperature. And so like it says to form mountains. So we're talking about like a huge area. So think of like a, it being a huge region for regional metamorphism. So again, that in this case, the pressure is gonna align our minerals um, if we have enough pressure into these like bands or layers. So both of these are actually metamorphic rocks. It's just that um, the first one hasn't been through as much heat and pressure as the second. Um, so pressure comes with more depth, so deeper into the um, earth, more pressure. We can have confining pressure, so that's pressure that's just coming from all directions, 
or differential stress, which is when that stress is coming from one location. So uh, we are going to classify our metamorphic rocks um, by their texture. And that texture for metamorphic rocks describes whether it has that layered or banded appearance or not. If it does, we call it foliated. So I have some examples of those. So our slate, schist, and gneiss all have um, a layered or banded appearance to them, even though they sometimes the layers are really obvious and sometimes they're not as obvious. So for example, um, so first up I have um, our, our uh, slate. So it's kind of hard to see there, but there are some very, very fine layers with our slate. Next we have um, schist. This one's kind of a little shiny. It's got a little bit of mica in there. So that's what makes it shiny, but it also has some layering to it. This one is the most obvious. So this is your nice, hopefully you can see those lines as they go across. So again, that's foliated texture for each of those because we have those layers or those bands. Non-foliated will just mean that it doesn't have any of those layers or bands. So for those, we've got marble and we've got quartzite. So here's some marble, some nice white marble. Again, no layers, no bands, non-foliated texture. And then we've got quartzite, no layers, no bands, non-foliated texture. And then the last part is just reminding you that these rocks are made of minerals and therefore uh, they have uses. So we find these um, in what we call vein deposits. So it's when some sort of hot fluid, so hydrothermal, hydro water, um, thermal being hot, right? Um, they are dissolved in that and then they kind of get in between those fractures or those bedding planes. And then when it cools, the metallic ions come out and are left behind as a vein deposit. For our non-metallic minerals, um, we can use them as building materials or industrial materials. Um, so for example, like corundum has a pretty high hardness. So it makes sense that we would put corundum on our sandpaper. So very small pieces of corundum on our sandpaper. And I believe that's it. That is it. Thanks for watching.